All right, so welcome everybody to the October Tampa Bay Fossil Club <laughs> coming to you live from my fossil closet. Uh, Eileen in Virginia and Tyler Bowling from the University of Florida in Gainesville. So welcome everybody tonight. We'll start off by normal stuff, giving you some information about the club. Uh, USF remains closed and a lockdown uh, to outside uh, organizations. And I don't even think they're running any of their own club stuff through the, uh, uh, through the school. And we're not gonna get an update till late December on what they're planning to do in January. So we'll be scrambling pretty quick should they allow any, any um, uh, folks from the outside or clubs to meet there. I, when they do open, I am going to request that we meet across the street as we did a few years ago. The building is bigger. It'll give us room to move around and give those who want to social distance more of an opportunity to do that. Or who knows, we may be on lockdown again uh, come January. We just have to play it by ear and see what's going on in the country uh, with the COVID. Um, apologies for the sound last month. There was really nothing Eileen could have done. It's no reflection on her. Uh, she she comprises, first Eileen, we thank her. She comprises our entire IT department. Uh, but Dr., I'm sorry, uh, Peter Harries was coming to us live from the Black Hills in South Dakota. Uh, there, there was nothing we could have done to fix that. Uh, about every 10th word disappeared, as you guys know, but we got through it and it, uh, it worked. Uh, talking with our speaker tonight, Tyler Bowling uh, from the Florida Shark uh, program. It does seem like we have a really good connection, so there should be no problems tonight. I also want to thank Eileen for working on our, our webpage. She has the webpage completely redone. I think she, she's continued to make uh, changes to it. I know she recently did the... Uh, uh, Telephone, what do you call it when it's the, uh, for your, when you look at it on your phone better? Oh yeah, mobile. Mobile, she made it mobile friendly. So you can see it on your, on your cell phone better. Uh, we thank her for that. We really appreciate it. And, oh, and tonight I'm going to be giving away this, the dang camera. We'll be giving away this uh, Smilodon Carnassial replica. Make sure you hear that's replica. It's not a $5,000 tooth. Uh, but we, um, we're going to give that away tonight, and I'm going to do it old school, where you're going to call in just like on the old uh, late night radio station, rock and roll station, and I'm going to give it away to the 13th caller tonight. We're going to do that after the uh, speaker is finished, uh, Tyler is done, but you're going to need to get a pencil, and I'm going to write, give you my phone number a couple times here, so you can do it and have it in advance. I'm going to give it to you the first time now. It is... <laughs> I trust you not to get my phone number out. I don't want no soliciting <laughs> uh, princes or princesses in uh, other countries giving away millions. So we'll be giving that away tonight, 13th caller. And I'm going to do it that way live so you guys hear to make sure I'm not just passing this off to my nephew or somebody. Oh, uh, let's see here. Please keep your dues up to date uh, with the club while we're out. And just so you can see, this is a newsletter with our with our your address on. If you look right above your address, it shows your expiration date. And a lot of folks call saying, "Hey, well, how do I know when I expire?" You can tell right there. And you can also, if you have any questions about that, you can uh, contact the club on the Facebook page or at TampaBayFossilClub.com. I'm sorry, Tampa Bay Fossil Club at MSN at MSN.com. Our last, our, we had a really nice Chronicles issue, and you only get that if you're a member. Uh, last issue highlighted uh, five of uh, five local amateurs. One is really, uh, he's an amateur legally, I guess, but um, some would call him a paleontologist, two of them maybe. But they are, they are technically amateurs who received a spe new species named in their honor out of a recent publication that came out of the University of Florida through the Invert Lab. Um, those were uh, Dave Hoffman, Rob Carlson, Andreas Kerner, and actually Andre, I think this is Andreas Kerner's third uh, species he's had named in his honor, and Carol and Bernie Peterson, uh, who I believe they're on the East Coast right now. Andreas Kerner is actually out west in New Mexico, uh, but those, those five people were local people associated with the club in some way, and I want to thank Dr. Bob. He wrote an excellent article. I asked him if he could uh, put something together. 
He said he'd throw something quick and easy together. He sent me three or four pages. It turned out really nice. It really made the issue. So check that out. Hopefully you all got it in the mail and you, you may get it in the mail hard copy or you may have chose to get it online, which is in color. Uh, but I do want to thank you. I know Dr. Bob's watching. So thank you, Dr. Bob. Well, you think it would be easy to get speakers when a lot of people are on lockdown still or not going out or restaurants are half capacity, but we've had a, a heck of a time and some of the scientists we've talked to uh, being booked up through Christmas already on Saturday nights, Friday nights. A lot of clubs and organizations are bringing them in through Zoom and actually made it easier for them to do presentations where they, when they had to travel, they could only do so many, but on Zoom, uh, they book up pretty quick. So I apologize for not having it in the newsletter, but Tyler Bowling was uh, kind enough to uh, step in at the last minute to be our speaker. He is the manager of the Florida program for shark research at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Uh, his first comment was, he said, I'm not a shark expert, uh, so what would you like me to do? And I said, well, well sharks certainly are our most crossover species. Our, our folks love anything sharks. We've had shark folks in the past, uh, um, oh, White, I forgot her name, first name. Uh, we had uh, Whitenecker. 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 Last name was White Dr. Whiteneck. Uh, Moto from the um, from the uh, Mo Marine was uh, spoke spoke to us as well. And those were all kind of modern shark topics, and everybody really enjoyed them. So I'm going to welcome Tyler Bowling. He's going to take over the screen, and don't forget. Let me give you that number one more time. It's. <laughs> Write it down. I'll get this way live so you guys hear that I don't cheat again. And we'll uh, turn it over. He's going to take over the screen. Tyler Bowling. Thank you very much. Thank you all for having me. So tonight we're going to talk about modern sharks. And we're going to start with kind of the, the stigma of sharks. And that there seems to be a lot of fear surrounding sharks today. People are afraid to go in the water. Uh, and I like to equate it to walking in the forest at night. So it's dark, you can't see what's out there, you hear a noise and your mind starts to play tricks on you and you create a boogeyman. Well, the ocean is kind of like the forest at night in that you can't always see what's around. So your mind starts to create monsters where there are none. And so we like to, as a society and, and in pop culture play up sharks and shark attacks and make them more than they, they usually are. And they're pretty rare events, but if you watch the news, they seem to be a lot more common. So tonight I'm gonna to shine a spotlight on these animals and try to dispel some of the mysteries. And at the end, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. So first off, uh, just kind of setting the, the bar of kind of what sharks are, uh, on the most basic level, and then we'll talk about their differences between the species. So first off, all sharks are fish, but not all fish are sharks. As I'm sure you guys are familiar with, they have a cartilaginous skeleton, which doesn't preserve very well. Uh, occasionally, you, as you know, you find some vertebrae and certainly teeth. They go through those quite rapidly. Um, they're a very old group. Uh, some of the earliest um, fishes, even almost over 400 million or years old. And they've gone through many, many different shapes and sizes, as you can see here. And some of them, most assuredly, are still extinct. But what I really want to drive home tonight is that a shark is not a shark, in that People love to say sharks do X. Well, in reality, shark A does X and shark B does Y. And what this graphic here is showing you is the relatedness genetically between species. And so on the left, there's a great white, which it goes up to a bracket of a bull shark and a tiger shark. And then on the right side, there's a kangaroo, a dog and a rabbit. And they are about equivalent so a great white is about as related to a bull shark as a kangaroo is to a dog. So when we say sharks do blank, it, it often leads to trouble because they don't always overlap. So, and I hope to demonstrate that tonight. So first off, they have very, very diverse diets and 
incredible morphology of teeth. For example, this frilled shark has these tiny little barbs, which are specialized for snagging quick prey like squid. Uh, compare that to something like a nurse shark, which have these tiny little cusps, which are great for crushing shelled prey like lobsters or shellfish. And as I'm sure you're familiar with, shark teeth are on a conveyor belt, so they don't have to worry about losing them when, when biting into prey. Uh, they can easily be replaced in only about a week or two time, and they can go through tens of thousands in their lifetime. All sharks have gills, though they have a varying number of gills, but they lack the bony operculum that a normal uh, fish would have. Their gills are quite fleshy and a, a sensitive area. Now shark skin is covered in what we call denticles or skin teeth. These individual scales are actually have uh, enamel, tooth-like qualities, and they're quite sharp. Um, as you can see, they're almost blades. And if you rub a shark in the wrong, against the grain, it can actually cut you. I just looked at a case last week uh, where a young woman had abrasion damage. She wasn't bitten, but just, just a shark brushing against her was enough to cause her cuts. Um, and when you work on sharks on the side of a boat and you get all cut up, we actually call that shark burn. Um, but some species can actually flex their muscles and their, move their denticles in such a way that can increase their hydrodynamics in that moment. So this is a very complex system that we're, we're still learning about. Uh, it additionally has my, antimicrobial uh, properties. So bacteria have a hard time growing on it, which helps naturally with their immune system. And we as humans are kind of stealing the technology and using it to build uh, better planes and uh, recently they've come out with a new product that's hopefully be successful in that they're using a dentical like uh, design that's 3D printed for counters in hospitals so that they don't grow as much bacteria. Now, I, I, everyone's usually familiar with the fact that sharks have uh, electroreception so they can feel the electric impulses given out by other species uh, muscle movements and heartbeat. But you may not realize that that is usually the last sense that the shark use in detecting prey and the hunt. So actually sharks will detect their prey first through hearing low frequency sounds caused by uh, an animal in distress thrashing, travel long distances underwater and their ears are specifically designed to pick that up. Uh, then smell takes over. Uh, you've probably heard the, the old saying that a shark can smell blood a mile away. Um, and a lot of people get confused and they think that if they scrape their knee instantly, every shark in a one mile radius gets excited. Uh, it doesn't quite look, work like that, but after the blood has diffused in the water over a mile, it's still detectable. And it's worth mentioning that there's no evidence that sharks are attracted to human blood. The same is not true of fish blood. And the next is pressure. So they can sense pressure through their lateral line. So there's these uh, jelly-filled canals along their spine. They have little pores where they can actually feel vibrations in the water. So as they're getting closer to this prey, they can detect its movement and presence and pinpoint it to an exact location. And that's when vision takes over, so they can zero in. And as predators, it's imperative that their sensory systems remain as undamaged as possible because they have to go and actually kill and catch and kill their food. So their eyes usually have some sort of protective mechanism. Some sharks will roll their eyes into the back of their head to protect them. Some have a protective membrane. And when they're close enough to that prey, they can't see in order to protect their eyes. And that's when the electroreception takes over. So they can actually detect the prey item without having to actually visibly see it. Now, some sharks, such as lambid sharks, like great whites and makos, are actually warm-blooded. It's a different type of system than mammals and birds, they, but through moving their muscles and pumping their blood through their, their, their high-energy swim muscles and moving it back into their core, they can heat up their bodies. And the champion of this is a salmon shark, which is pictured here in the upper right. And as you can imagine, they eat salmon up in Alaska, 
and they can actually generate enough heat that their blood is seven degrees Fahrenheit above the ambient water temperature. So they're nice and comfortable in freezing water. Some sharks are world travelers. Uh, this is a, a recorded uh, GPS tracked great white that went from South Africa to Australia. And there's tiger sharks that have been documented making this journey as well. Uh, some of this is tracking different uh, prey items such as uh, whales or uh, seals. Some of it's for mating and most of it is we don't know. Uh, we're still trying to figure out why uh, they go certain places at certain times of the year. And someday we'll hopefully have an answer for that. Some sharks lay eggs. Uh, whereas others have live birth and they have a very different but same concept as a placenta in a mammal. Uh, additionally, there's some sharks that lay, that have eggs, but they hatch inside the mother. And I think the coolest uh, shark egg has to be the horn shark, which you can see here. It's actually a corkscrew. And so the mom horn shark lays this in the sand and then she picks it up in her mouth and then she screws it into a rock crevice, nice and secure. And what pops out is frankly adorable, right here. That's a baby horn shark. And they have those out on the West Coast. And they're called horn sharks because they have a little tiny spine on their dorsal fin. So if anybody tries to eat it, they get stuck in the mouth. Some sharks like this bonnet head, we have these right here in Florida, can actually clone themselves, yes actually clone themselves. And so this is a process we call parthenogenesis. You can go home and impress your mom or your wife or so-and-so with that big long-term parthenogenesis. So it's essentially a virgin birth. So if there's no males around, the female can actually self-fertilize in a way. So the, her eggs will start to germinate with only her DNA and she'll create an exact copy and we didn't even know about this until we had uh, sharks in, the, in an aquarium that was all female. And we had a Jurassic Park situation in that there should be no babies in Jurassic Park, but life finds a way. So I think we're starting to, to understand that a shark isn't always a shark in that they don't always do the same thing. They're very diverse and they're very different. So some cool examples are we've got really fast sharks like this mako, which can go almost 60 miles an hour. We've got really slow sharks that sit for hours at a time in ambush like this wobegon, waiting for prey to get too close. We've got giant sharks like this whale shark, bigger than two school buses lined up. And we've got tiny sharks like this dwarf lantern shark, which can fit in the palm of your hand. We've also got really ugly sharks, like this goblin shark, which has a projectable jaw. And we've got sharks with crazy adaptations, like this thrasher shark, which uses its tail as an actual whip. It flops it over its head and creates a, an actual burst of, of bubbles that can stun fish, and then just gobbles up the stunned fish. There's even sharks with pockets. So last year, we discovered in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, this species, deep water, that had little sacks under its pectoral fins or its armpits, and it could spew bioluminescent gel. And so to try and understand why it might do that, put yourself in the place of the pocket shark. You're on the playground and there's a bully. And your first reaction is to spew bioluminescent gel from your armpits. Either the bully chases the gel, thinking it's more interesting, or it freaks out and runs away. That's what the pocket shark does. Now, skates and rays are sharks too. They're just flat, exactly the same. So let's talk about sharks we have right here in Florida. So uh, in relation to bites, we see actually the majority of our bites from our coastal sharks, the black tips and the spinners. Now these are very minor in nature and they're normally on surfers. 
And so these sharks hunt way close into shore, right up on the edge of the beach in the surf to mask their approach from the fish. And they hunt generally during the middle of the day. Well, when there's, they're hunting in the surf, so they're overlapping with people, they're in the middle of the day when people are gonna be there, it's very murky water because it's all churned up in the waves and they make mistakes. But generally speaking, the human's bigger than the shark in these cases. So the shark bites the person, realizes it's not a fish, realizes it's bigger than it is and freaks out and they both go their separate ways. Now, our kind of our medium threat level is our great hammerheads and our lemon sharks. These sharks generally won't bother anybody, but they're best treated with a little bit of respect. And the sharks that we really need to, to be careful around, which can be quite dangerous due to their size, um, is our bull sharks and our tiger sharks, which uh, are two of the top three offenders worldwide for bites. And bull sharks aren't actively predating on a human. In fact, they're, they're incredibly aggressive. Uh, they can also enter fresh water quite easily, as can lemon sharks, but not quite as efficiently as a bull shark. Bull sharks can go far up rivers, but they're so doped up on testosterone that they're just ready to get anything and everything out of its territory. And so it's not necessarily looking to feed, it just wants you out of its space. So they're best given a wide berth. Uh, and tiger sharks are, are generally not in a predation mode when they bite somebody. It's, it's almost in slow motion. They come in, they just glide in and they slowly will bite somebody. But when an animal that's 15 plus feet long and has teeth that have evolved to cut through a turtle shell gives you a quote unquote test bite, uh, it does a lot of damage, unfortunately. But these are very rare events. Um, the remaining sharks are sandbars, bonnet heads, uh, which don't bother people at all. And lastly are your nurse sharks. And nurse sharks do bite folks, but it's almost always provoked. They're very docile animals, and they're usually what's advertised as feed the sharks uh, on your Disney cruise. And people love to go and hug them and restrain them and are shocked when they end up getting bit. So a little bit about uh, ISAF, or the International Shark Attack File, which is under the Florida Program for Shark Research, it was actually originally started in the Navy, uh, started in, the Navy in 1958. Um, at that time, it, and it still is, um, the only globally scientifically verified database of shark attacks. Um, there are regional uh, files, but uh, they generally work with us and we're the only ones that cover the whole globe. There are some uh, private citizens, non-scientists who uh, keep track of this type of thing. Um, but anyway, the Navy eventually lost interest in it. They, following some uh, naval battles where ships went down and, and people were, were bitten by sharks, they were looking into building our shark repellent and trying to understand what was involved. But as warfare shifted away from the Navy and there was funding and interest was lost, the, the file was passed around and it, it stayed pretty quiet for many years. In 1988, it was brought to the Florida Museum by uh, George Burgess, and he really turned it into what it is today, and just the powerhouse and the respect that it now garners. Uh, today, we have actually, as of this morning, uh, we've investigated 6,575 cases uh, all over the world. And those cases range from unprovoked to uh, data insufficient to turned out to not even be sharks. Most people, when they feel pain in the ocean, they just assume it was a shark. And that's where our job comes in to make sure that it actually was a shark. And so let me walk you through kind of the process of determining the investigation or for investigating the bites. So first off, there has to be a bite. We will hear about this from a variety of ways. Uh, sometimes we're privately contacted by a victim or a witness, and then we'll investigate. It doesn't make the news. Um, a lot of times local authorities will contact us that they've had an incident and we're gonna investigate and we'll work with them. 
uh, and sometimes we just find out on the news with the rest of you and then we jump into action and we try to play catch up. And so we reach out to the victims or witnesses and we get the statements and they fill out questionnaires and we, we talk to them on the phone or if they're in Florida, sometimes they'll actually come up and see us. Uh, and we'll figure out what exactly happened. And ideally we'd like to get photos of the injury. And so we'll do an analysis of the bites and we have a large reference library of shark jaws, which we can compare the bites to and we can try to determine the species involved. And this isn't always possible. Some bites are too extensive or just only a partial and it's not enough to make a definitive call. And we err on the side of caution in our classifications, both as the type of attack as well as the species because we don't want to assign blame where we don't have enough evidence to support it. Uh, and we'll figure out who, who was at fault. Was this a, a totally unprovoked incident where the person was minding their own business and the shark came out of nowhere and bit for reasons we don't understand? Or was the person doing something maybe they shouldn't have and got bit? And then we use all of this information in our research to, to look for trends and uh, to advise safety measures uh, locally and around the world. And so we're asked to advise on stuff all the time uh, to, to better protect the average beachgoer. And so I've, you've probably heard me say provoked a couple of times now. So let's just talk about uh, what exactly some common provoked incidents are. So generally in the file, when we compare unprovoked to, pro to provoked incidents, we've got about a quarter of bites are provoked. And these generally take one of four forms. Uh, spear fishermen who, you know, they spear fish, there's blood in the water, some fish is flailing, the sharks come in, and then this person who, you know, very proud of their catch does not want to give it up. So they're gonna fight the shark and nine times out of 10, they're gonna lose. Um, we have shark fishermen who have never fished for shark before. And so they're a little naive and they get in over their head and they get bit by accident. Um, luckily now in Florida last year, and I'll talk about this in a, in a bit, uh, we actually passed some legislation that uh, you have to take an online course to get trained in how to handle these animals so that we can avoid personal injury. Here's our Disney crude shark huggers. Uh, I, I don't know the, the logic. They, I mean, if you did this, if you just grabbed a dog and held on and it bit you, no one would be surprised. I don't know why a shark is any different, but we see this all the time. Um, and lastly are our kind of baited shark dives. Uh, you throw a bunch of bait in the water, you give people, you know, bleeding fish and they try to hand feed the shark and well, you can guess how that ends. So what does all this data tell us overall? So generally speaking, we see an average of about 60 bites a year unprovoked. So the shark uh, was, so the person did not initiate, was, couldn't even, in some cases, wasn't even aware that the shark was there until they were bitten. We generally have four to uh, five fatalities a year. Um, and in the long term, we're actually seeing uh, an increase in bites, but in the short term, a decrease. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and as I talked about earlier with the tiger sharks, uh, what we see are a lot of these are test bites. They're not an active predation event. Uh, they're not you know, biting the person over and over. It's a single bite. Nope, that's not what I wanted. It was too bony. I don't know what that was. I'm gonna swim away. And the fatalities that we see are generally from larger sharks and they're due to placement of the bite. So they're usually on surfers who get bit in the leg and it hits an artery, but it's a single bite from a large animal and unfortunately the person doesn't make it. So we think that the long-term increase in bites, and we're talking from 1900 to 2020, it's increasing. That kind of ties to world population. There's more people, there's more people uh, recreating in the water. So there's more opportunity that they're gonna get bit. Uh, I, well, I can't stress enough that the, the odds are still very low. Now in the, the short term, in the last decade or so, bites are going down. And we think this is actually because of safety. 
uh, people are more aware. There's better safety practices. There's more awareness. There's more sign at the beaches. We've got lifeguards on duty who are you know, watching. So people are, are actively uh, stepping up. So what are these odds? Uh, I've, I think I've, I've made it seem like it, it happens all the time. And uh, your odds of being bitten by a shark are one in 11 and a half million. Uh, it, it's frankly, you know, astronomical and it's not worth worrying about. And actually dying from being bitten by a shark is less than 1% in two and 64.1 million. It, it's not worth, you know, laying a night laying up at night over and, and avoiding the beach. So let me demonstrate some, some things that are actually more dangerous than sharks. So when you go to the beach and the kids dig this giant hole, uh, you, there's actually a one and a half times more likely uh, chance that it will kill a jogger in the early morning because they didn't fill it in. You are 33 times more likely to be killed by a dog you are 76 times more likely to be struck by lightning than bitten by a shark. You're 250 times more likely to be bitten by another human being. You're sitting by one of those, scoot over. You are just about 400 times more likely to die on a party boat in the state of Florida, hashtag spring break. So it's probably not gonna happen, but to minimize these already astronomical risks, I'll give you some quick safety tips. First, always swim with a buddy. There's safety in numbers. And if something does happen, you've got help right there to help you fight off the animal or help you get safely to shore. Avoid swimming at dawn and dusk. Uh, many of the larger sharks are actively predating in these low light hours. We call that crepuscular. And they use, uh, they specifically go out at these hours because the sun is lower in the sky and it masks their approach from prey, just from based where the light is. You should avoid swimming in schools of bait fish. So if you see a bunch of mullet, don't swim in the middle of the mullet because a shark will come in with its mouth uh, through the school. Avoid where people are actively fishing. Don't wear jewelry. Uh, shiny objects uh, in the water often attract sharks because they look like fish scales. And you shouldn't splash for extended long periods because uh, the low frequency sounds you generate actually sound like a, a uh, struggling fish. So remember way back when I was talking about the provoked bites and uh, how shore-based fishermen who were new to shark fishing would get bit? Well, there's some mandatory new guidelines in the state of Florida on how to best be safe. And these went into effect last year. And so they have to take a mandatory online course to get a, their license for shark fishing. So in addition to your regular fishing license, you'll get a shark fishing permit. Uh, you cannot chum on beaches. So we want to avoid attracting those to areas where people will swim. Uh, prohibited species uh, have some very clear guidelines. So for example, if you hook an endangered small tooth sawfish, which are luckily on the rise here in Florida, you're required to cut the leader line hook wherever you can, uh, as close to the animal as you can, without removing it from the water and without putting yourself in danger. Um, and so, and you also cannot remove under any circumstance a prohibited species from the water. And you frankly shouldn't uh, remove a shark from the water unless you plan to harvest the meat. And the reason for that is, uh, is stress. Not only the fact that they can't breathe, but, but long-term stress. So you know when you go to the gym or you go for a run after you're done or you've been going for a while, your muscles start to get really sore. And that's called a uh, buildup of lactic acid. And that, so that soreness is our body's way of saying, hey, you've, you've done enough, you need to go take a break. Well, sharks don't have that kind of cue. So when they're struggling on a fishing line for hours and they're taken out of the water and they're you know, struggling to breathe and they're you know, bitten held up for pictures and all kinds of other stuff, they're building up all this lactic acid uh, with the stress and the effort and whatnot, and they have no shutoff. 
And so that lactic acid can actually build up to toxic levels, especially in larger species. Um, so you can release a shark, it may swim off kind of sluggishly and it'll wash up dead within an hour. So that's why we really want people to just cut the line and people are, you know, are, are rightly concerned. What about the hook? What about all kinds of other stuff? And, and generally the, the risks associated with leaving the hook in are far less than you know, manhandling it uh, further. So the question comes like, should we even be catching sharks at all? Many species, especially larger ones, are slow to reproduce. Uh, it, for some species, it can take until they're more than 20 years old to actually reach sexual maturity. And they only have one or two pups every year, every other year or, or longer. And that's a long time to rebuild a population. Uh, larger predators in general have high levels of mercury. Tuna, swordfish, you'll often see warnings about this uh, in our oceans that you should avoid eating these meats. Uh, and that's uh, a buildup of these toxins in the environment which uh, culminate with apex predators. And so when we eat them, we're eating the highest concentration of mercury, which is not good for us either. Uh, there's the issue of thinning, which is pictured here. Uh, and finning is the practice of removing the fins from a shark and, and unfortunately generally throwing the still live animal back in the water. This, this practice is illegal in, in most of the world, but still unfortunately goes on in large scale due to poaching. Uh, and it's sold into the Asian shark fin supermarket. And it's used as a thickener, uh, a gelatin almost for uh, the soup. It's, it's tasteless or, and uh, it's viewed as a, a wealth status. And so there's, there's been small uh, scale um, movements to try and end this cultural stigma behind shark fins, uh, but that's still an ongoing battle. Uh, and generally speaking, the finning targets these larger pelagics that are slow to reproduce and high in mercury, uh, such as a, a blue shark or a mako shark or etc. So my answer actually is yes, we should be catching sharks, but we should be catching the right sharks. The US in particular has, in some cases, very healthy shark numbers. Um, for example, black tips are booming. And so, well, other than the fact that they're doing well, why should we bother going out and catching a shark and, and even bringing it home to eat? Um, the money, from fishing licenses, fishing gear, it all goes into an excise tax called the Dingle Johnson Act. Uh, and this money cannot be touched by outside influences. It goes uh, to the Natural Resources Commission for each state and nationally. And this is put directly back into the systems that, pay, the, of, that those people are using. So 80 to 90% of government funding for conservation is paid by hunters and fishermen in the United States. And so not only are these folks out there actively funding, not only the research, the conservation, the habitat restoration for the species they're actively pursuing, but everything else that lives there, but it also these fishermen gain an interest in an investment in the species and the habitat they're taking a part in because they're now part of that ecosystem when they're out there fishing for these animals. And so they're gonna be the ones who are gonna, you know, help the scientists. They're gonna be, you know, protesting to, to save the, the, the ecosystem. They're the ones who really care. Uh, and these small coastal sharks, uh, they don't have those high mercury levels. They're safe to eat. And frankly, they're, they're quite tasty, especially black tip. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say that it tastes kind of funny. Let it sit overnight in some milk and then throw that on the grill and you won't be disappointed. I'd like to thank you all for listening. I'll leave this up on the screen for a minute. There's a QR code that can take you right to our website so you can learn all about sharks. There's different species. Uh, we have uh, information on, on bites dating back all the way to the 1800s. Um, uh, we, there are older bites in the file, but they're a little less trustworthy. So all of our numbers start around 1880s. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about sharks, uh, when there's not a global pandemic. I recommend heading to your local aquarium and, and local museums. And, and thank you all very much for listening. Well, thank you, Tyler. I'm sure they're applauding at home. That was a, a very interesting PowerPoint. Very well.
pretty well put together. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'll run a, a few by him out of our, uh, I can see them on the Facebook page. The first one that came in from Dr. Foley asking, has the shark population, the diminishing shark population in some areas uh, had any influence on the shark bite uh, count that you said was going down? No, because, or at least not that we can detect. I, I, I cannot say definitively yes or no, but generally where these um, fish or sharks are being pulled from is the middle of the ocean where there are no humans. Now, granted, some of these species are very wide ranging, um, but generally we see the majority of the bites from uh, sharks that are living along the coast. So I, I would be hesitant to, to say that bites are down or, or even up. They're asking, uh, the, the Purple Crow from Texas is asking, that's Nancy Jacobs, what is your uh, personal favorite shark and why? My personal favorite shark, um, it honestly changes because there's over 500 species of sharks and we find like one or two new ones every year, uh, deep water species. So we're always finding more and uh, my ADHD brain takes over and I'm like, oh my God, that's so cool. Cause they each have this weird new little facet. So it's kind of like uh, the day of the week, but generally speaking, I come back to tiger sharks again and again. Uh, they just sort of break the, the rules. They, they do their own thing. They're very strange in some regard. They're not picky. Um, their, their teeth are, they have these special notches in them that actually allow them to saw. And so that's how they can predate on sea turtles, whereas other sharks have trouble getting through the shells uh, where they can just like a buzz saw. Uh, so they're just fascinating animals, very strange. So Dr. Greg Shanos is asking, regarding shark bites, do humans not taste good? Sharks seem to take one bite and then stop. Do they not they, they don't see they don't always seem to rip somebody apart uh, no so generally uh, the thought is that um, it's just a test bite so it's like what is this thing uh, I'm gonna give it a sh I'm gonna see what it is and they just run into a thick bone they're not used to that uh, large mammals in the water are going to have a thick layer of blubber uh, it's going to be foreign to them when they run into a thick arm or leg bone uh, and so I, I can't say, I've heard myself that, you know, people taste bad. Uh, I don't think there's any way we could know that, uh, but generally it is a single bite. The shark realizes, eh, this wasn't what I was after. And we really think it's due to those, just kind of the, the thick bones, but it could also depend on the species. So Steve Ficari at Paleoanalysis is asking, you said a lot of the shark attack investigations normally require volunteers to come forward. How does the process differ when there's a fatality? So, uh, again, we, we work with, you know, local law enforcement, um, and there are additional uh, shark attack files that are local. There's an Australian shark attack file, there's a South African shark attack file. And so we've got people on the ground so that we don't have to hop on a plane necessarily who can go interview victims, we look at autopsy reports, um, we analyze all the autopsy photos. Uh, and so we just try to piece together as much of the information as we can. Uh, and obviously there's, there's information we just can't know. Okay. Uh, lots of folks are thanking you. We get a stream of that coming in. And I don't see any more questions. I have one question for you for me. Sure. How old were you the first time you read Jaws? book? Honestly, I waited a very long time to read Jaws because I was very torn about Jaws. Um, I didn't read it until I was in college. I was an adult. Um, just because it had created so much fear for sharks, I ended up loving it. Uh, not to say that I, you know, it, it hasn't done some damage, but uh, it's kind of often the case I've, I've found within the shark research community that a lot of people really love Jaws, the movie, the book. Um, uh, it's just a, sort of a, a primal attraction, I guess. 
Uh, one, one more question did come in. Oh, I, I read it when I was 13, by the way. That was a big mistake, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, we'll take this as the last question uh, from the uh, live stream. How hard is from uh, the Purple Crow in Texas, Nancy Jacobs, how hard or easy to tell what kind of shark does the biting in an attack if the shark has never seen? It can be very difficult. Um, so a lot of times, you know, the, the news will just contact anybody that studies sharks locally and they'll say, ah, I don't know, it was maybe this. Um, and it's, it's just frankly just not that hard. You have to study years and there's a whole uh, investigative forensics behind it. We study, uh, I, I've even read a, a whole mountain of uh, police scientific journal papers about knife wounds to study this stuff. And so we'll, we'll go in, we have a reference library of jaws. So we've got examples of, of you know, teeth and spacing between the teeth. And we've got different sized individuals. And so it's not always just a clean one, two, there's, you know, there's movement of the head. And so you have to be familiar with how these, these animals will uh, move when they actually bite something. So for example, the tigers, uh, remember I was talking about the sawing, they'll move their head back and forth. And so the, the wound has a very distinctive look. And you'll basically kind of start with, you know, sometimes it's, it's obvious because it'll just be a, there are occasionally where it's just a clean in and out and it's just perfect teeth marks. That's not that common, but it does happen. And there are certainly cases uh, almost half the time where we can say, well, it's probably X, but we can't say for sure. And that's, you know, what separates us from Joe Schmo on the street is that we're, the information that we're providing to the public and to the scientific community, uh, it can be trusted because we've got the evidence to back it up. Additionally, because it's, you know, not an exact science and we do the best we can, we're moving into DNA. And so we're actually swabbing not only objects that have been by sharks, but people. Um, and so we're just starting the people bit this year and I'm very anxiously awaiting uh, our first test results, hopefully very soon, where uh, we're hoping to get saliva out of wounds. And so we can definitively say, regardless of what it looks like, okay, we've got the DNA. We know for sure it was a blank. Um, and we're already, we've done that successfully with kayaks and surfboards and boats and all kinds of other stuff. But the, the, from the actual wound, that's, that's the ticket. So. Good. Very good. Well, thank you, Tyler. We appreciate you coming on with us tonight. Uh, I do have a few more announcements. Um, being as we're not live, I have a few people. I don't have the people there poking me to make sure I stay on course. And I did get a few texts during your presentation. So I have a few more announcements to go to um, announce. And then we'll be giving away this replica smiling on Carnassio. You're welcome to hang around on the um, on the screen here or go to the soccer bar. <laughs> um, but I, I do appreciate you being with us tonight. Very good presentation. Thank you. So the, the announcements that came in were uh, from uh, Cena and Bill. Because of us not meeting live in person, we are, um, some of the checks may be delayed but we do have your money. We will get those checks deposited soon and, and take, take care of that. The um, uh, Eileen, can you come on for a second? Yep, what's up? I'm not coming on the screen on my end. I don't know if I'm working. Oh, no, you're good. good you're deal. good. I didn't want him to think he was talking. And then why is he giving out the announcements? <laughs> um, no, you're but, good. The Peace River trip, Fred has told me, is, is scheduled for October 24th. Uh, that is the only field trip we will have uh, running. The mines are, are still remain closed and, and certainly probably will till January. Uh, but that Peace River trip is water depth allowing and the current allowing. Watch the uh, new website and calendar uh, page that Eileen and Fred are running and Marlin. And if the water looks like it's going down, if, we, if the rain finally stops like it should, it should only take a week or two for the water to go down. The October 24th trip is probably 
iffy on whether it happened or not, but by November, we ought to start getting back into the rivers. Uh, by November, we should start getting back into the rivers and y'all just be safe and no kissing or hugging down there in the water and we should all be good. Remind you guys that we're really hoping to get Fossil Fest 2021 uh, to be our, our breakout event. That's March 20th and 21st of 2021. And one last is the Florida Fossil Hunters are having their show in Sanford, Florida. It's in the current newsletter. There's an ad for them. It's at the Sanford Community Center on October 10th and 11th. Please try to get up there and support those folks. I can tell you it's hard to run a club during COVID. I am very glad our meeting, or I'm sorry, that our show, Fossil Fest, won't be till March uh, of next year when we have some time to see what's happening. So please try and help those folks out and go up there and uh, see their show. I think they only charge four or five bucks to get in the door. Throw them an extra couple bucks. They didn't ask for that, but what can it hurt? You know, they, if they're asking for it, get made. They, they need it. All the clubs need to stay alive during this time and um, they can certainly use the help. Again, they didn't ask for that, that's from me. Um, let's go see them October 10th and 11th. And all right, we're gonna do this for the first time. I hope it works. So I gave out my phone number. And I'm, my, my wife's telling me how to use my phone. I've done it <laughs> once or twice, but I'll... Uh, so I'm gonna take the 13th caller starting now. Oh, and there's a nine or 10 second delay. So I'm standing here waiting for nothing. Like, where's my phone? 813. My cousin, Altrin Newman. First caller. Thank you, Altrin. Second caller. Third caller. Thank you. Fourth caller. Thank you. Fifth caller, Doug Job. Thank you. Sixth caller, Barbara Fight. Seventh caller, Bill Fosher. Eighth caller from Erie, Pennsylvania. Ninth, ninth, help me keep track. Ninth caller, Steve uh, Doug Job. Tenth caller, tenth caller, Steve Vicari. Call from what number? Eleventh caller from Clearwater. Sorry. 12th caller, David Fosher. Help me out. 13th caller, Leslie Brannon. You there, Leslie? Hang on. Let me get to I got okay. Everybody else stop calling. I'm gonna, I don't know that people get any calls. Um I can decline Altrin. Turn Le Leslie. 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 I said Leslie Fosher. Mike wouldn't <laughs> like that. Leslie Brannon. No. Leslie Brandon Davis. So Leslie, she's our storekeeper. She deserves this. We'll get that to you, Leslie. Thank you for uh, playing tonight and doing the call-in hey, thing. Thanks. And that being said, join us on Facebook. Uh, make sure you join us on the YouTube channel and make sure you like or hashtag or whatever you kids are doing to make that work or look better for us. I think after we get a certain number of members, Eileen can start just scooping up the money as it comes in or something like that. So that being said, we appreciate you, Tyler Bowling, and thank you very much, Eileen, and TBFC out. All right, thank you all for a great live stream. We are ending. Thank you, it worked perfect tonight.